Okay. Good morning, everybody. I hope Barry's having a wonderful day. So, before I get started, I thought I would just remind us of the game plan when trying to prove a big O claim where I have two complexity functions. I want to show you that F is big O of G where I have two complexity functions, F and G. So, just I want to remind you of just this overall game plan. As long as you understand the game plan or strategy for proving the claim, everything should fall into place. It's a matter of just formulating an argument. So remember, if I write f is big O of g, this is the same as saying that there are two constants, c, this is a positive real number, and n0, which is a positive integer, such that this inequality is true, f of n is less than or equal to c times g of n, for all n grow equal to n0. This part right here is very important. We can't just say, oh, well, we can't just blindly assert this, that I picked the two constants. I can't do that. I have to make sure that this inequality holds for all n grow equal to n0, not just at n0. So that's one key thing that I find is a common pitfall when trying to prove big O claims is they just plug in the value for n0 and they just presume it automatically works for all other values of n. That's sort of why we are using a proof technique here that I'm going to show you a few other tricks, uh, but most certainly there's a lot more than just these. Uh, for example, last day I mentioned how you could do, for example, root solving, uh, where you take the difference of f and g, and you could figure out what the roots would be in that case uh, if you treat it, the inequality as an equation. Now, but the only problem with this approach is that you have to know more about the functions. For example, are they increasing? Are they not decreasing? For example, if I know that I pick a value for n0, how do I know the function isn't just going to start sporadically doing this afterwards? So these are the things that why you'll see that I'm going to do this in a somewhat different way than maybe just doing that approach. So I'm going to try to give you a formal argument for doing this, but you're going to find I'm going to give you a lot of what I would argue are helpful techniques for doing this so that you don't have to go to a lot more tools than you don't, you don't necessarily need all of these tools. So the first one I really want to talk to you about is something that I didn't show you last time. First, we just kind of went head, we dove in first and we picked the C, then I figured out add zero. So I just kind of pick C and then I see if it worked where I could get an N0. Now there's sort of pros and cons for doing this. Uh, first, if I just pick a C, I may, it may, it's a lot of trial and error for this. So instead, I'm going to try to give us a little bit of a couple ideas for how we can get a feel for how we could pick these constants. Sometimes there's actually a very clear way you could always pick the constants, which is neat. So. The first one I really want to show you, just to kind of walk you through this idea, is remember, if I have this as f, and this is g, this is 3m squared plus n is big O of n squared. I would like to prove this. Now, remember, this is the definition of big O here. So I ultimately want to make sure that I find these two constants. That's my goal. And I need to make sure that these two constants work such that this inequality holds. Now, if f here is 3n squared plus n, and I have something over here on the right-hand side that's c times that thing that's inside the big O right here, n squared, one strategy I was going to suggest is that we kind of come up with a look-alike on the right-hand side. We try to make a, what I usually like to call, we try to mimic the left-hand side using the right-hand side. We make a, we make the, we make a look-alike. This isn't by any means a technical term, I just think it's helpful to remember this. So we're going to make the right-hand side of the inequality a look-alike to the left-hand side. That's the first thing maybe might be a good idea to try. So in this case, I would like to make n squared look kind of like this, but do it in terms of n squared. And we'll see if we do this, that there might be a much simpler way of arguing than having to pick a, just pick a given C and then just hope that we can find N0. Now, like I said, when you're doing this, you have to be a bit more careful because sometimes you just got to have a little bit of scrap paper, try a, try a value for C and see if you can get N0. Or if you pick N0, you want to try finding a C, that's okay. You don't have to do it in specific order. 
If you want to do it where you play around with, do some algebra with this inequality first, on the presumption that you're going to simplify it, because obviously this inequality has to be true for all of these, but we don't know what this is yet. So you might do some simplifications, that's okay. But uh, I'm usually going to find I'm going to show, uh, I, sorry, first I'm going to present you C first and then I'll get N0, but it doesn't have to be the case. Sometimes it's helpful to pick C last, then N0 first, because it makes it easier to verify the inequality once you know that uh, there's a, a particular C that might be ideal to pick, akin to what I do here when I pick N0 at the end. So let's walk through this, and I'm going to try to use this idea I gave you a suggestion about. So first I start off by saying what I'm going to do is usually a good strategy when you're writing out a proof. So I'll say we find constants. We find constants C, which is a positive real number, and N0, which is a positive integer, such that, such that for all N greater equal to N0, then all I'm going to do now is I'm going to put where F is and what G is. You'll notice that these are just what I'm doing over here, right? I'm just plopping those in. But really, I'm not just straight up writing the definition. I'm actually saying what I'm going to do to establish that I could use the definition. So almost think of it like a game where somebody asks you, hey, look, can you prove that F is big O of G? And the game, of course, is I find these two constants. So if I could find those two constants, then I can present to somebody, hey, look, I have these two constants. So by the definition of big O, it has to be the case. So that's going to be the game that we're going to play hypothetically, such that for all n greater equal to n0, we want to show that 3n squared plus n is less than or equal to c times n squared. Now I'm going to try to make a lookalike or mimic the left-hand side using terms that are n squared here. Now, does anybody have any ideas, if I wanted to try to mimic the left-hand side using terms of n squared, so when I mean terms, I mean like I want to make it look like what's over here. So for example, I have an n squared, I have something like 3n squared here. Uh, maybe I can make something that looks kind of like n out of an n squared. Are there any ideas for what I maybe might pick for c? Or any ideas? So what should we pick for C? So three sounds like a pretty interesting suggestion, but I'll give you I'll give you a bit of a, a question about this. So if I were to make it three here, notice very quickly, if I make it three, I'll have three n squared plus n is less than or equal to three n squared. But notice that that right there, notice there's three n squared here and there's three n squared. You'll see very quickly if I subtract both sides of this inequality by three n squared, you'll end up with n is less than or equal to zero, right? But that's, that, doesn't, that doesn't make any sense for us, right? That means that there's not going to be a value, enough values for n to make this work. Four sounds like a much more appropriate one. I like the idea of three, but I think we need to make it a bit bigger. I think four might be a good idea. Let's try out four. Let's try four. So now once I've picked four, I'm just going to tell you what I'm going to do next. Then, then we need, we need to find n zero such that, such that for all n greater or equal to n zero, 3n squared plus n is less than or equal to 4n squared. So, so far we're up to the point where now we need to just figure out what an uh, appropriate value for n0. So the way that I'm going to do this, I'm going to derive n0 by finding the smallest value for which will make it easier for me to prove that this inequality works for that value of n0 or larger. It doesn't have to be the smallest possible value for n0. 
any value for n0 will work as long as it satisfies this inequality for all n grow equal to that value. So like in my previous example I did last day, we picked n0 to be 5, but it's okay if n0 was 6 or 7 or 8 or 9 or 10. We most certainly could do that, right? So a question, can we divide by n squared, then it'll be supposed to be n is n to be 1, so then we could get c is equal to 4. So you can, you can, there's other ways to approach this. Uh, for example, uh, you can divide by n, and you'll notice very quickly you have something like 3n plus 1 is less than or equal to cn. And then you could play around with it from there, perhaps. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can derive a c in n0. The key thing is just making sure you lay out your reasoning carefully. That's the big thing. So one other big thing that when you'll notice that when I wrote down this inequality, I didn't just blindly write this down, right? I say, I'm saying I'm trying to find a value for n0 such that for all of these values, this inequality holds. It's true. So it isn't just that I write down this blindly. Notice that there's actually set up to this inequality being written here. I don't know uh, if even the value of n0 actually exists at this stage. I am trying to derive it. So here we go. So here's going to be where I'm going to go with this. So if I make the right hand side look kind of like the left hand side, I'm going to use a strategy I usually like to call the bucketing approach. Now, I don't think that's a, it's a term that's very commonly used, but you'll see what I mean by this bucketing approach. You'll see that it's actually a really clever use of inequalities that makes it easier to prove claims like this. So you don't have to make a lot of careful articulations or do a lot of algebra. So watch this, watch this. Notice that, so I'm going to make an observation. But the thing is, the key thing is that this observation should be easy for me to demonstrate in a way that is so elementary that I should be able to persuade anybody here. So notice that, that 3n squared plus n is less than or equal to 3n squared plus n squared, which this is equal to 4n squared, right? Now, this is an assertion I'm making. I'm going to back it up with a reason. So I'm claiming that you can justify the following. So uh, my claim is that this is true for all n grow equal to 1 as or because of the following reason. So now I'm going to explain where this comes from. So there's actually really something interesting going on with what I've just written here. So notice here that I can compare the terms here. This is a scented whiteboard marker, by the way. It smells like apples. I don't recommend doing this with a regular whiteboard marker. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. It smells very good, though. I've had this one for years. It still works. So notice that I have 3n squared and I have a 3n squared, right? You can argue very easily that 3n squared is less than or equal to 3n squared, right? Because it's a, they're, they're the same thing, right? So if I had 3n squared, I could claim I had 3n squared is less than or equal to 3n squared for all n grow equal to 1 because they're equal to each other, right? In fact, I could go a step further and just say I'm going to divide both sides by 3n squared and I end up with 1 is less than or equal to 1, right? Because they're equal. Right? You would agree with me that that makes complete sense, right? So I'm going to just make a note about this. As 3n squared is less than or equal to 3n squared for all n grow equal to 1. And now I want to look at the next pairing of terms here. So notice that if I look at this term and this term, Notice I have an n and an n squared. Notice that if I divide, if I look, if I consider n is less than or equal to n squared. Notice that if I divide both sides of this inequality by n, I n, this is no different than me writing the following. So this is true. So this is no different than me rewriting this as 
n greater or equal to one, because if I divide by n on both sides, I end up with one is less than or equal to n. Right? Does everybody see that? So what I'm going to do is the following. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna leave like, like this, because I think that this statement is easy enough for you to see that it should hold for all n greater or equal to one. Now, you might ask Dan, how does, does this tell me that this is going to hold for all n is greater or equal to 1? Well, let me, let me explain. So this is where the buckets come in. Okay, suppose that I have some buckets here. I have a left bucket and I have a right bucket. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each one of the terms. I'm going to compare the first term against the first term on both sides. So I have the left-hand side's first term, and I have the first term on the right-hand side. Remember, I wanted to make it so that they look alike, right? So I have 3n squared, and I have a 3n squared. Now, if I look at the coefficients of these, if I just straight up tell you, hey, look, the coefficients are what we're going to focus on here. Notice that if I have 3n squared on one side, I'm going to put that in my left bucket to represent the how much I have in my left side here. So right now I have 3 in there, and I have 3n squared on the right-hand side too. So I'm just going to put that in my right bucket. So right now they both have equal quantities, but the point is, is that when I know, I know that 3n squared is less than or equal to 3n squared, right? So I know that whatever's in this left bucket right now, that is less than or equal to whatever's in the right bucket. So now we've we we have we consider this on the left hand side and this on the right hand side. Let's consider n versus n squared. Now we know that whatever's on the left hand side in this case n, I compare it against n squared. n is in fact less than or equal to n squared. So notice that if even if I considered if n was an n squared, I could put that on the left hand side, but most certainly. If I put it, put a 1 also on the right-hand side, notice that I know n is in fact less than or equal to n squared, right? So notice that the quantities in the left bucket never exceed what's in the right bucket. So all I'm doing is going term by term, sweeping from left to right, and I compare their terms. And I just throw them into the buckets. But what does throwing in the buckets actually mean? So what, what, what are the quantities? What is this versus this, actually? It's so like, what are these two things? They're actually the sums over the inequalities. So notice if I add this inequality to this inequality. So if I take this inequality, so notice I, take, I add this one to this one. Notice it's, I add whatever's here on the left-hand side to this on the left-hand side. We add whatever's on the right-hand side here to this right-hand side here. Notice that you actually get literally what I've written right here. So this is actually a sum over the inequalities. So, so this is an important note for you, is that I'm just summing over the inequalities. That's all that's happening, is I'm just summing over the inequalities to get that. Uh, so do, 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 both sides. Oh yeah, you could technically try solving for it, but remember, we're solving over an inequality. The one thing you have to watch out for is if, like I mentioned at the beginning of lectures, if you attempt to solve for a value for n, you have to make sure you invoke something about the functions themselves. For example, if I find a particular value for n0, I need to ensure that at every point after n0, it has to be the case that, that this original inequality is true, right? So you may have to, if you use that a kind of approach, you may have to invoke something about those functions when they're written in the form that you're trying to solve over. For example, is, it, is whatever you have an increasing function? Does the value always go up whenever I increase the value of the input? Is it, is it, does it dip down? If it dips down, that's going to be a problem, right? That's usually when we, if you try using an approach like that, you would try to find the largest value that you could pick for n0. But remember, you have to invoke something about the function to make that work. 
but hopefully that is clear. But notice all I did here is I took each one of the terms, I compared the two, and I just summed over the, these two inequalities. These are just me comparing this term against that term, this term against this term. So remember, this is just me giving my statement, and this is me justifying it. So is that step clear to everybody? So all I've done is I'm just bucketing everything for the left-hand side into one bucket, and I'm putting all everything into the other bucket for the right-hand side. So notice that there is, I don't need to pull out any fancy fancy calculus to do this, right? I don't have to do any of that. It's just very elementary counting here. But I'm just relying on your understanding that I can just divide, notice that I can just divide these inequalities with the appropriate terms and it comes out really easy to justify them to somebody. Just like when I take n less than or equal to n squared, if I can divide by n on both sides, I can see that n is greater or equal to one. Akin to something like the first example I did last day. But I could do that with any one of these. And that is not a coincidence, by the way. There's actually a general recipe to what I'm doing here. So now that I have an idea for what I'm doing here, so notice that I have the left-hand side here. This is the right-hand side of the inequality. Can somebody tell me a good value for n0 to be? What should we pick for n0 here? So take a note. Yeah, so what it seems like the value to pick. The reason why is notice that this inequality is true for n is greater or equal to 1. This one holds for n is greater or equal to 1. That's actually why I said for all n greater or equal to 1. It's because this inequality works, that inequality works. These both work for n is greater or equal to 1. I would just pick the largest value amongst these if ever they had to differ. And yeah, so I'm just going to choose n0 to be 1. So let's choose n0 is equal to 1. Therefore, 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 by selecting, so we're done the game. Therefore, by selecting such a C and N0, by the definition of big O, big O, 3N squared plus N is big O of N squared. And we're done. That marks the end of the proof. So notice that this final step is important because I am actually invoking the definition of big O. Somewhere I have to invoke the definition of big O. Uh, do we have to write everything when proof? Yes, yes. You're, you're, remember, notice that this is an argument, right? I'm giving you actually an argument when I do this. So it is a formal proof. Uh, so that's what I'm looking for when you're doing this. So, so you can start off by playing around with C and N0. Then I want you to try to formulate it as an argument like this. So notice that this seemed to be a very interesting thing I just did here, right? So I used this idea where I'm going to make the right-hand side look like the left-hand side. Now, you might say first, Dan, is that just a coincidence that you did? Like, can you like do this all the time? Well, there's certain kinds of functions that, yes, this will work. So I want to show you another example where let's try to reinforce this idea. So let's head over here. Let's do another example. So one thing, like I said, you have to be very mindful of the fact that you're looking, you have to always consider what kind of functions you're looking at. For example, these are, for example, polynomials. So polynomials have a nice behavior that's very easy to predict. Most certainly most functions that you're playing with have this property as well. That includes things like logarithms. Uh, logarithms, just be very mindful of the fact that you may have to pick a large enough value for n0 because something like log base 2 of 1 is actually equal to 0. It's not, it does, it's not, that isn't actually a, that might not be big enough. Uh, so in those cases, you might have to pick a value like for n0 a little higher. So let's talk a bit about this example here. So let's try to see if we could use the same approach here, even though this looks a little bit more complicated. So I'm going to do the same thing I normally have been doing. So I'm just going to, so I'm going to re, we are going to, we compute uh, constants 
constants c, which is a positive real number, and n0, which is a positive integer. Keep in mind, it's very, I want to be very clear, it's okay if you write positive integer c and n0, you can write positive integer n0. That's literally what this means here, is I'm saying c is a positive real number, n0 is a positive integer. You don't have to use the fancy symbols at all. These are just abbreviations. But yeah, no, like the pro the reason why I'm giving you this more comprehensive look at this is so this is where I'm meeting, I want to meet my expectations with you, just to be very clear. Um, so, so let's, uh, let's, uh, let's proceed here. So I want to find these two constants such that, such that for all Edgar or equal to Ed zero, one fourth, one fourth n squared plus two n plus two is less than or equal to c times n squared. So now this is where it gets fun. Now, does anybody have any suggestions for what we should pick for c? Any suggestions at all? Based on the strategy we tried last in our previous example. Any ideas at all? And remember, C is a positive real number. It doesn't have to be a whole number. It just has to be positive. I see a very nice constant. 17 over 4 seems like a really nice one. Um, one third? One third might not be big enough. I, I would have to check that one. A one, um, one might not be big enough. I'm thinking, I like this, there's one suggestion about a 17 over 4. Now, you might ask, Dan, where, where the heck did 17 over 4 come from? So here's, I'll, I'll reveal my magic trick that I was doing. So notice that I'm trying to mimic the left-hand side. So watch this, watch this. So notice that I'm just going to pick it to be 1 fourth, because that's the coefficient of this term. Notice that n squared is, is in fact, the dominant term on the left-hand side. So I'm just going to try to make it look like n squared. You have to be very mindful of this fact when they're, say, two different kinds of functions. It may not work in this the same way. This only is something you could really... It may be applicable in other scenarios, but for polynomials, this is a really nice general approach that you could try out. But notice that the dominant term matches to this one. But if it's any less, that's okay too. But, but the thing is, it has to be... Like, this trick is, that we're going to be using is very common for polynomials. So, I have one quarter plus... Let's say we need two plus two. And if you actually carry out this, you'll find that this is actually exactly equal to 17 over four. So we're gonna pick C to be 17 over four. Then, then we need to find, need to find N zero, need to find N zero. So that for all n or equal to n zero, one quarter n squared plus two n plus two is less than or equal to 17 over four times n squared. So somebody's asking, is this technique only for polynomials? I could, sh you can actually, I will be able to tell you with certainty that you can use this technique on, on polynomials. But the, the approach and ideas, they're applicable in other scenarios. So you'll find that a lot of the things I'm showing you here, you can apply it in other scenarios. You just have to be very careful. Uh, but it, I will tell you definitively, yes, it works with polynomials. In fact, I will include the proof in the notes for you. Uh, for your own reading if you're curious about it. But I will show you what the trick is. Uh, so let's, uh, let's now proceed. So let's see what we could do with this. Uh, well, now keep in mind that we can use something actually quite similar to what we did over here, right? So I'm just going to observe, observe that, 
that 1 quarter n squared plus 2n plus 2 is less than or equal to 1 quarter n squared plus 2n squared plus 2n squared, uh, which this is in fact equal to 17 over 4 times n squared. Uh, for all, and we're equal to one. So that's the, remember, this is what I'm trying to, uh, this is a statement I'm making. I'm going to verify it by providing these much simpler reasoning now uh, because, because if I compare again, one quarter n squared against one quarter n squared, because one quarter n squared is less than or equal to one quarter n squared for all n or equal to one. Uh, let's compare two n against two n squared. 2n is less than or equal to 2n squared uh, for all n or equal to 1. Notice the reason why we could say that is that if you divide both sides of this by, for example, 2n, you'll see that you'll end up with, in this case, you should end up with n is or equal to 1. Then let's do the next one. We have 2 against 2n squared. 2 is less than or equal to 2n squared for all n or equal to 1. Well, you just divide by 2, and you'll see that you have n squared is greater than greater or equal to 1, which this should be fine for us, or at least I should be able to convince you of this fact that it should be okay, because n squared is in fact greater or equal to n, which is greater or equal to 1 for all positive integers. So I got these, and notice very quickly, you could see that I could just add up over these inequalities again. Ah, uh, so, so for each one of the terms on the right side, you include n squared for them. Yeah, so remember, I'm just trying to make it look a lot like the right hand side. So, yeah, so notice that I look at each one of these, so what I'm doing is I'm actually, for those that are noticing what I'm actually doing carefully, is I'm actually distributing 17 over 4 times n squared to make it look like the left hand side, but I'm writing it in terms of the, of the term I have here. So as I have one quarter n squared, two n squared and two n squared, if I actually add these up, I get 17 over four times n squared. So this is why I chose C the way I did, is I'm actually gonna distribute the, that 17 out of four n squared into chunks that look like what's on the left hand side. So that I could just compare them against each one of the terms on the left hand side. So that all I have to do now is I know this, this, and this. I just sum over these three inequalities. I actually end up with that line right there. So just to be very clear, remember this is a statement that I'm making, but I need to show you why that's the case. It's because of these three steps right here. In fact, if you want to make it clear for yourself, you can always rephrase it so that you could say, observe that these three are all true. And then you could say, then by summing over all three inequalities, we obtain that line right there. So that's another way you could rephrase the same thing, if it, if it makes it a little easier for you to see it. So now I have this. Now naturally, notice that all of these are n is greater or equal to 1. That's why I wrote n is greater or equal to 1 right here. And I'm just going to now proceed. So then I can say, I'm going to choose. So let's, let's choose n0 to be equal to 1. Then I'm just going to invoke the definition of big O, and then we're done. Therefore, by the definition of big O, of big O, 1 quarter n squared plus 2n plus 2 is big O of n squared. And that's the end of the proof. So I'm just showing you a nice simple way of arguing these things. These aren't the only ways to do it. Uh, most certainly, you can use all sorts of the fun algebraic tricks you may have seen in a course like calculus. Uh, but most certainly, I would, I would usually recommend you try to go for a simpler approach to argue these things. But because the main reason why is because it makes it easier to argue the points. Now, I'm, uh, the key things I just want to reinforce is that I'm not necessarily looking for the smallest value for n0. I'm looking for the one that is easy enough for me to prove it to you. Um, that's the big thing. That's the big thing here. When I pick one of them, I'm trying to show you the other one works.
Likewise, if I picked n0 first, I want to show you that there's actually a c that works. So I have to actually argue why that is. So anyways, I'm going to now reveal the magician's trick here. Uh, the, must the mustard and mayonnaise sandwich maker's trick. Uh, so here we go. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about this. So the first thing I need to emphasize is remember that we're looking at two specific functions. When you're considering other kinds of functions, you always have to take it on those grounds. But I'm trying to show you some general patterns that you can use to help figure out the constants. Sometimes you may have to do some algebra first as I annihilate the eraser. Or it may be the case that you may have to, well, usually it's simplified down the inequality a little further. Or you observe, the other thing, yeah, uh, otherwise you may have to observe some property that that function has. So you can either simplify it or rewrite it. So that's usually one extra step you may have to take if it's something that isn't going to fall perfectly into these kind of strategies. But definitely making it so it looks like the right hand side is one that I can strongly recommend. Yes, yeah, so watch this, watch this. This is where it's going to get fun. So I'm going to give you a general trick for polynomials. So here's a trick for dealing with polynomials. So there's a very simple but effective way of arguing uh, for any set of polynomials of the following form. Consider a polynomial of the form of the following form. So it's going to look like this. It's going to be P with input N, which is going to be A0 times N to the K plus A1 N to the K minus 1 and so on, all the way up to a sub k minus 1 times n plus a sub k. Where these are the coefficients of the polynomial, where uh, the coefficients uh, a0, a1, all the way up to a k, these are all real numbers. So if they're integers, that's okay, because all integers are real numbers. So if I imagine I give you a polynomial that looks like this. So, so the idea here is that given integer constant, so if I give you an integer constant, k greater or equal to 0, so for example, k could be 2 or 3 or 4, it's just some constant. But notice that this k here is the same one that I'm using here. Just keep that in mind. So given integer constant k greater or equal to 0 and coefficients above, above, you could argue that p is big O of n to the power of k. And you might say, Dan, like, what is that? <laughs> like, what is this thing? Well, you think about it. You look back at my previous example. Suppose that k was equal to 2. Then you would have the coefficients being 1 quarter, 2, and then another 2. So you might ask, OK, so how exactly can you like, so if you have this, how do you pick the constants? So the proof, I give actually a complete proof for you. Uh, if you're curious about it, you're welcome to read it. So, so if you're curious, it's in the notes. But here's the idea. Here's the idea. All you do is you pick the constant to be actually the absolute values of all the coefficients. So I take the absolute value of a0 and I add that to the absolute value of a1 
I add that to the absolute value of a2 all the way up to the absolute value of ak. So if I pick these, so if I sum over the positive version of each one of the coefficients, if that, any of them are negative, by the way, that's why I have those there, and n0 is equal to 1, this actually will always work, believe it or not. Uh, so, for example, that's actually why I picked 17 over 4 over there, is because all I did was I looked at the coefficients and I just added them up. And you'll notice by the similar reasoning I gave you, you can actually walk through each one of the inequalities that I used in my chain over here. I had three of them. If you actually walk through there, actually I did a very systematic way of actually verifying for you each one of them. Um, so I could like divide both sides by the next largest power and the coefficient, and you'll see that, oh yeah, I end up with something that looks kind of like n is greater or equal to 1. So you could actually do this more generally, but the general recipe is to use this as the constant. So the absolute value of the, so I take the sum of all the coefficients where I remove the sign if there's a negative value. I just make it positive. I must stress again, the goal is to see if there exists these two constants. They don't have to necessarily be the smallest pair of constants, but the point is, is that they exist. That's the big thing. So the number you might get here might be a bit bigger than maybe the most elegant one if you want to argue it, but this is one way you could do it. So are there any questions about this here? Uh, so I'm going to include another example actually in the notes, but I'll just quickly just give you a quick sketch of how we might pick the constants applying this idea. So suppose that I give you a function, say, 4n to the power of 4, 3n cubed plus 2n squared plus n, and I wanted to show that this is big O of n to the power of 4. So I want to show that 4n cubed plus 3n cubed, sorry, 4n to the power of 4 three, plus 3n cubed plus 2n squared plus n is big O of n to the power of 4. Uh, can somebody tell me what c should be and what n0 will end up being? Yeah, 10 and 1. Very good. So notice that all I do is I take 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1. Notice there's just actually a 1 here. It's just 1 times n. So 1 plus 2 plus 3, that's 6, plus 4 is 10. So using this technique, you just get 10 and 1. So you would actually argue in a very similar way that we did actually in our two previous examples. So if you actually take a look at the proof, it actually gives you the recipe for how you could always prove these claims. So yeah, so keep in mind that the smallest value you can pick for n0 is in fact 1, because it's a positive integer. But keep in mind that in these examples, we're finding that n0 works to be 1, but as you're going to see, say for example on the assignment, that it may be the case that you may actually have to find a bigger n0. But it may not necessarily line up with this approach, you have to do something else. Maybe you adopting this idea where we make it look a lot like the right hand side, but we might literally be able to make it look just like the right hand side, but we might need to make a bigger value for n just because of the nature of the function. Uh, if you're wondering which one I'm referring to, it's the one involving the logarithm. Uh, but yeah. But yeah, are there any questions about this technique that I described to you here? So you could do this with all sorts of polynomials. But yeah, if you're curious about the proof, uh, it's just in the notes. It's a... Uh... Ah, what if it's just a constant? So notice that... So here's the neat thing. Notice that if I gave you... So I'll actually show you just exactly how that actually is just a special case of this. So like I said, this is a very general claim that I've actually given you here. So notice that if k is equal to 0, if you look at that polynomial, what it should look like is this. It'll just look like this. So the, the function is actually literally a constant function. So the claim would be that, oh yeah, this is, so a0 is big O of n to the power of 0, which this is just 1. So that's where you get the big O of 1 here. Is that neat? So like I said, this is a very general claim that I've given you. And it gives you a very general strategy for doing this.
But does that answer your question about it being if it, what if f is just a constant? It's actually just a special case of this rule, actually. But remember, a0 could be like a number like 10 or 20 or 30, or it could be, it could be any constant. Perfect, perfect. So I thought I would show you that because I think it gives you a helpful idea of like how you might go about proving a big O claim. I gave you some general techniques. So generally looking at, making it so it looks like the right hand side is one way you go about it. Learning a bit more about the function itself is also another thing you could do. Um, what if there's missing terms? Um, <laughs> that's, that's a great thing. Whenever there's terms that are missing, well think of it. Think of, imagine if it was this form. Say for example, I gave you something that looks like this. Four into the power of four plus, plus, uh, plus n, like this. Like say four into the power of four plus n. If I rewrite it so it looks like this, it's no different than me writing four into the power of four plus zero times n cubed plus zero times n squared plus one times n plus zero. So that's how you could deal with if there's any missing terms. You'll notice that they're just, the coefficients are just zero. So notice the rule, the same rule applies and it actually just follows like our first example. When I did that, it's actually literally just the same thing that I did. It's the same trick. So this whole lookalike trick is actually very, it's literally how you could go about dealing with polynomials. But it's a general nice rule to start off with. It's a good starting point more generally. So how can we prove this and find C? So now here's the neat thing is, as I mentioned, I give the full proof in the notes and it actually follows, if you actually followed the reasoning I gave in my last two examples, the proof is pretty much a much more generalized version of this. Well, all it does is instead of having where it's just like three inequalities over here or two, like in my first example, Instead, what happens is you have a chain of about k, I believe it's k inequalities. And in each one of them, you can argue the same thing. You can argue that n is greater or equal to 1 is satisfied. So it just the trick here is that when I pick these coefficients, sorry, when I pick c like this, I can make it mimic the left-hand side, just like I did in my previous two examples. But by making them positive, at least, if they were originally negative, I only make the value bigger on the right-hand side, right? It doesn't get smaller. It only gets bigger if I use an absolute value sign if that was originally a negative for the coefficient. So if it was like negative two, for example, then it makes it positive two. And that only makes the quantity on the right-hand side bigger. So if you actually look at the proof, you'll see that it's actually just a summation. Instead of it just being this plus this plus this, that's actually, instead of comparing them one after the other like this, I could actually write it like a summation. Yeah, no, wonderful questions. So I was thinking, when we shift gears, I want to start talking about how we can prove something, uh, a given function. Ah, so if for the missing term, we would pick c is equal to 5. Do I have to compare n cubed and n squared? Well, if, it, if there isn't an n cubed and n squared in your inequality, it would be just like my first example I did today. So the whole idea is that I'm just giving you a general rule that you could always use. But the thing is, you would specialize it for your given complexity functions. But yeah, if these weren't here, obviously you wouldn't need to write those down in your argument, right? Because they're just, they're just be, it's not very useful. Because there isn't a cubic term, nor is there a square term. Ah, so for, for constants, how, would you, how could you prove that f is big O of 1 if there's no such thing as an n in the definition? Like I said, remember, the definition for big O is, remember, it follows the following idea. Remember, we had to find the two constants, c and n0. We had to find these two constants, such that in this case, imagine I gave you some constant function like c. Like say, say if c was some number, I don't know, let's make it make it 50. What I have to do is I have to find a value for n0 such that 50 is less than or equal to c times 1. And this has to hold for all n or equal to uh, n0. But you'll notice very quickly that this inequality has no n in it 
So any n would work, right? Because it, it doesn't vary on n at all. So something like this you could pick, for example, n0 is equal to 1, right? Because like, you could see quite clearly that there is no n in here. So any n will work. <laughs> but you have to pick an appropriate value for n0. But yeah, no, wonderful question. Yeah, no worries. So what I thought we would do is we shift gears and let's start talking about how we might prove a complexity function is not big O of another complexity function. So that's one important thing that we need to do. Because we've seen the game plan for proving an is claim. But how about is not? That seems to be a little bit different. It isn't just simply hey, look, I find the two constants, right? But I want you to come back to this idea that I had about where we're thinking about it like a game, where I presented the constants to somebody. So remember in my proof, the idea is that I, I find the two constants, I show you the recipe for how I got them. I show you why they work. So remember in the original is claim, what I did was I find these two constants such that the inequality that I have, the f of n is less or equal to c times g of n, it is true for all n greater or equal to n zero. So suppose that I'm instead playing the game with the person claiming that it is in fact the case that it is big O. So what would me as, if you think of me as like the devil's advocate here, or I'm just playing, I'm playing devil's advocate with myself, what would it mean for me to say that f is not big O of another complexity function? So let's talk a little bit about that. So suppose I want to try to show that f, a function f is not big O of another function. So all we have to do is we take the definition of big O, we flip it on its head we do what we call logical negation. We just negate this definition. Because we know that f is big O of g implies that, like remember it's an if and only if statement, this means that it's equivalent to me saying there exist these two constants, c and n zero, such that for all n greater or equal to n zero, f of n is less or equal to c times g of n, and that has to be of course true for all n greater or equal to n zero, right? So, we have to ask or say a question. What would it mean for f to not be big O of another one? Well, let's think of the game that we've been playing this entire time. We find the two constants, and it has to be that it always works for n greater or equal to n zero for that inequality, right? So let's flip it on its head and imagine I'm playing devil's advocate now, and I'm saying, hey, look, it's not the case. It's not the case. So, so now I gotta lay out the rules for how I could do that. So all I do is I negate the definition. So we negate the definition of big O. So this is one standard way of doing this. So what does it mean? So if I tell you that F is not big O of G, this is if and only if. So remember, whatever I write over here, if this is true, whatever follows after this also is true. If this is false, then whatever is coming after here is also false. These are equivalent statements. If and only if. And I'm just gonna, for the sake of exposure, I'm going to show you how I could write this using those symbols I used the other day. Remember I used the upside down A and the backwards E? Like there exists and for all, I'll just reiterate them verbally. Such that for all C, that are positive real numbers and n0, which are pos sorry, positive real numbers, positive integers. There has to exist n, which is going to be greater than or equal to n0, such that the inequality is actually the other way around. f of n is greater than c times g of n. Now let me play, say this in plain English, because I think, I think at first this looks a little daunting because we haven't talked about statements that are like this. So what does it mean? So remember, the original game is I find C and N zero such that for all, 
n greater or equal to n zero, the inequality originally worked, where f of n is less than or equal to c times d of n. So me as playing devil's advocate, I put on my devious hat and I'm like, ah, let's see, I'm gonna show you that you're actually wrong. Um, what, what I could do is I could show you regardless of which c and n zero you pick. So suppose I'm trying to prove it. That I gave you a c and n zero, I actually have an argument regardless of what value of c and n zero you pick. I can always find a value for n that is big enough such that this inequality actually is true. The one that is actually the negation of that original inequality. And that's actually all we have to do to prove that something is, or f is not big O of g. So notice the game plan now is, I don't know what c and n zero are, they're arbitrary. And my goal now is to find a value for n. So now I find n now. So I have to, I have to give you an argument regardless of what c and n zero are, where I could pick n such that this inequality works. And I just need one value of n. That's all I need to make this work. So the upside down a, that means for all. So, so the upside down means for all or for any. The backwards e means there exists. So I thought I would show you this just to, just to give you some familiarity with these symbols. I don't use them very often, really at all, but most certainly I like to show them and expose you to these things every once in a while. So just look at them as abbreviations for our purposes. Just like when I write C is a positive real number like this, just look at this as an abbreviation. I'd be saying a positive real number C. So let's see what we could do with this. So I'm going to show you two different ways I can actually adapt this technique. So the first one is I literally just use this definition. The second one is I'm going to play devil's advocate with myself using a technique called contradiction. It's a standard proof technique, but most certainly the way it works is that I play devil's advocate with myself by presuming a statement that I know that will lead to a statement that is always false, which at first it sounds really weird, but I assure you it's actually really, really elegant if you think of it. So I'm going to show you first a approach using this, what have we just described, our game plan just now. So here's the first approach I'll recommend. We could just do this directly. So just use this. So I'm going to do an example using this approach. And then I'm going to do another example where I'm going to show you how you can do it with contradiction. And on the assignment, I'll, I will not tell you which one you're allowed, that you have to use. I'll be okay if you use this approach or the other one. It doesn't matter to me which one you like more. But it, logically speaking, they lead to the same conclusions. <laughs> um, it's just a different way of formulating an argument. So anyways, let's do an example. So we're going to try showing, so let's show that n squared over 2 is not big O of n. Now before we get started, You've got to first look at a statement like this and convince yourself that, oh yeah, this, this has to be true, right? If you take the simple rules that we talked about, notice that I have n squared over 2. I could drop the, con the multiplicative constant, the 1 half, and you'll see I have n squared, like something that looks like a quadratic, and this is a linear term. So you know right away, seeing as big O is an asymptotic upper bound, that this statement has to be true, right? If somebody asked me that this is big O of n, you would say, no, that doesn't make any sense. So let me just walk you through this again. We'll walk through the game plan with this. So I'm going to do this example over here just so I have a little bit more space. So let's head over here. So we're going to try to show that n squared over 2 is not big O of n. So let's do this. So depending on how much time we get, we might talk a bit more about uh, properties that Big O has, but we'll see how far along we get. So here's an idea of how I could prove this directly. 
So remember the game plan here is that for all C and N zero, it has to be the case that I have to be able to find you a value of N that's bigger than or bigger than or equal to N zero, such that the inequality, the original one, when I flip the inequality, it has to be true. So I don't know what C and N zero are, so I'm just gonna assume that somebody, say, playing devil's advocate with me, gives them to me. I don't know what their value is at that time. Just like if somebody were to present me a claim saying that F is big O of G, they might present these two constants to me. Imagine it like a big bucket and I have some fish in there and maybe I have sticky notes that are on the fish. I pull out the fish, I take the sticky note off and I look at it I'm like, okay, that's C and N zero. Let me show you how that doesn't work. So that's gonna be how we're gonna set this up. So let C, which remember is a positive real number, right? And n0, which is a positive integer, right? Be arbitrarily chosen. Uh, R. The reason I just can't sell, spell today. Arbitrar <laughs> arbitrarily chosen and fixed. So this is an important part of this setup is that you just imagine somebody gives you C and N zero. I don't know what their values are. They're just arbitrarily chosen and fixed. Fixed is a fancy way of me saying that they've been picked and now you have their values, but I don't know what they are. So let's talk about this now. So I just, just like we did earlier, I'm just gonna tell you what my game plan is. I'm just gonna find N, right? So we find so we find n greater or equal to n zero such that such that n squared over two is greater than c times n. Now, notice very quickly that I have an n squared and I have an n here. We're gonna use an idea that the chat actually had suggested earlier on when we were looking at some ways to prove these kind of claims. I'm gonna divide both sides of this by n because it makes it a little easier to see what we might need to do to find n. So remember, all I need is one value of n to make this work. The trick is it may depend on c and n zero. So notice that So notice that n squared over two is greater than c times n if and only if, if and only if, n over two is greater than c, implying, now if you multiply both sides of this inequality by two, you end up with the following. You end implying n is greater than two times c after multiplying, multiplying both sides of the inequality by two. both sides of the inequality by two. So now I actually have something really interesting here. I have an inequality like this. I have n is greater than two times c. Now if I can make sure I pick n such that this is satisfied, we're done. That's all I have to do but I have to make sure I pick a value for C, sorry, for N, that is going to be big enough that it is bigger than or equal to N zero. And it also has to be that this works. So I have a suggestion for how we could do this. So I imagine it like I'm blowing up my balloon. So this is the setup for the argument. I've set up my, I'm gonna blow up a balloon and I'm gonna show you a value for N such that if somebody came to me and I wanted that balloon saying that F is big O of G, I could pop it and I could tell you what the value of n is. That value of n is like the needle that will pop the balloon. So pick n is equal to the following. So I'm going to use a max function. Now, you, if you've never seen a max function before, all it does is it picks the largest value among its inputs. So I'm going to pick n to be the maximum of n0. So this will ensure that n is greater or equal to n0. And I'm gonna pick it so that, such that I make sure that that inequality is always going to hold. 
So I'm going to make it so it's 2 times C plus 1, where I'm going to introduce this notation here to say round it up to the next highest integer. Now, if you've never seen this notation before, this is what we refer to as a ceiling function. It's also referred to as the ceiling or ceiling function. So this notation here. What ceiling means is if I give you a number like 2.2, .2, it will automatically round up to the next highest integer. It doesn't round in the typical way. It actually just straight up just goes to the next highest integer if it's greater than that whole integer amount. <coughs> My apologies. So for example, 2.2 .2 is equal to 3 if it's applied to the ceiling. But notice that the number 2, the ceiling of 2 is just 2. So if there's a fractional part, it automatically rounds up to the next highest integer. There's another version of a function like this called the floor function. <coughs> it's called the floor function. I believe I have a little bit of space right here. So another one is called the floor function. It has notation like this. It looks like uh, if you took brackets and you cut off the tip tips versus this one, you, top, you chop off the bottom tips. Um, here, for example, the floor always rounds down. Uh, for example, if I give you 2.2 .2 here, it just chops off the fractional part. So you just get 2. But if I have the floor of 2, I just get 2. You actually are actually a lot more familiar with floor than you may know. Uh, for example, when you do integer division in a lot of programming languages, like if you take an integer and you divide it by another integer, you're actually doing it an, an integer, you're doing a division with a floor operation, actually. Because all it does is chop off the fractional part always. So you may actually be a lot more familiar with the floor function than you might know, <laughs> possibly. But I just want to mention what this notation does. All it does is just rounds it up to the next highest integer. So if it has a fractional part, it just bumps it up to the next highest number. So the reason why I'm doing this is so that, one, notice that n. Remember, n is an integer, right? It's specifically, it's a positive integer. So I have to make sure that I make sure that whatever comes out of this max function is in fact a positive integer. So that's why I have this ceiling function. I make sure that it is in fact gonna spit out an integer. I'm gonna add one to it to make sure it's just big enough because what happens if C is actually an integer? It may be the case that it's not big enough. Um, so I'm just gonna add one off the end just to make N big enough so that when I plug in this value of N, Notice that if it's bigger than n0, you'll have the ceiling of 2c plus 1. So you put that right here and notice that this inequality most certainly has to be true, right? So you just substitute n for this, you'll see that actually this inequality holds. And in fact, n is greater or equal to n0. So that's all we had to do. Then we have n greater or equal to n0. And for this value of n, this value of n, the inequality is satisfied. The inequality is satisfied. Therefore, therefore, n squared over 2 is not big O of n. And that's the end of the proof. So remember the game plan here is just find an n that works. Uh, so we don't have to have a proper value of n. So you just mean like an actual, so you're talking, so remember that technically speaking, c and n zero are in fact fixed. I don't know what their values are though. But yes, normally when you do these kinds of proofs, normally it's something in terms of n zero and c. If that clarifies, that's what I mean when you're picking a value. So what do you mean proper value? Imagine you're talking about like a number like five or something. You'll find that almost always in these kind of proofs, you'll find that it ends up being something kind of like this, where you need to make sure that n is big enough that it's larger or equal to n zero, but also is big enough that it causes this inequality to be satisfied. But yes. But yeah. So that's, that's one way of doing it. I'm going to show you the other way, and I think this will actually be a perfect place for us to stop once we do that example.
So let's show, I'm gonna show you quickly the other approach you could take. You may or may not have seen this approach before, like this proof technique. But regardless, it's also a fairly powerful one. But you're gonna see that the game plan is actually very similar. It's just recast in a somewhat different way. So approach two. So here's another way you could do this. And I'm like I said, if you like one over the other, you're welcome to use either one. I'm not gonna expect you to memorize or know how to do both of them simultaneously. If you like one of them, you can stick with that one. Just make sure you understand how it works. So this is a, the approach to is a proof by contradiction. So you might ask, okay, so how does a proof by contradiction work? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna assume the negation of the claim that we are actually trying to prove. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that F is in fact big O of G, and then I'm going to show you that it actually leads to a, what we call a contradictory statement. A contradictory statement is a statement that is always false. It's always false. So I'm gonna show you an example of how you would carry this out. So it's just like my devil's advocate game I've been describing to you this lecture. Show n, we're gonna try showing that n cubed is not big O of n squared. Let's try doing this. So I'm gonna use this technique and show you how you could do this. So I'm just going to start off by assuming the negation of what I want to prove. So if it's not this, then it, I wanna show that it is. So I'm gonna, sorry, I'm not gonna show that it is. I'm just going to straight up presume it is and see if we get a bunch of nonsense as a result of this. So assume n cubed is big O of n squared. So what does that mean? Now let me elaborate. Then, what is the definition of big O? There exist those two constants, right? There exists c and n zero. A c, which is a positive, positive uh, real number, and n zero, which is a positive integer. Uh, such that, such that for all n greater or equal to n zero, n cubed is less than or equal to c times n squared. So, so you, one thing you're really going to notice here is the goal is we're going to, because remember, I'm assuming that n cubed is big O of n squared. That means that this statement as a result is true under that assumption. So the goal here is I'm going to show you that if you assume these two constants exist, that this inequality is gonna get satisfied simultaneously for all n greater equal to zero, but also it's not going to be satisfied for some value of n that is greater or equal to zero at the same time. But though that is literally a contradiction because you can't have this being true at the same time as its inequality being flipped for some value of n, akin to the first example we did. So watch this, watch this. Since n is greater or equal to n zero, right? That's true for this inequality. Um, then, then we can divide then we can divide both sides of the inequality of the inequality to get, so notice I have n cubed and I have an n squared. If I divide by n squared on both sides, to get, uh, to get n is less than or equal to c for all n greater or equal to n zero. But you should look at this right away and say, Dan, that doesn't make any sense, right? C is a constant. So let's see what we can say about this. So I'm gonna wrap this up in a minute and we'll get you on for the rest of your day here. So notice that regardless, sorry, regardless, uh, regardless of the value of C, of the value of C, N cannot be less than or equal 
less than or equal equal to C to C for all n grow equal to n zero because n isn't a constant, right? n is not a constant and grows without bound, right? And grows without bound. So now I'm gonna come along. Remember I told you about blowing up my balloon. I'm gonna blow up my balloon. I'm gonna now pick out a value for n. I'm gonna sharpen that up as my needle. I'm gonna pop the balloon. So here we go. Hence, for example, if n is going to be equal to the max of the ceiling of C, so the ceiling of C and n0, and I'm just gonna add one to whatever the result of this is. I could make it so it's the ceiling of C plus one. That's okay too, but I'm just showing you a variety of ways I could write this. Um, uh, this value is greater or equal to n0, but is larger than c. Larger than c, uh, violating, violating n is less than or equal to c uh, for all n greater or equal to n0. And we derived a contradiction. We derived a contradiction. And that's the end of the proof. So it's a contradiction because I showed you that there is a value for n such that the inequality no longer works. But the claim is presumed that it is the case that n cubed is less than or equal to c times n squared for all n squared equal to n zero. So anyways, with that being said, when we come back next time, I'm gonna summarize some properties that big O has, and then we're gonna start talking about recursion. So I'll say thank you very much, and have yourself a beautiful day. I'll see you tomorrow.